Hello, I'm Stefan Hell. I'm going to show you that MinFlux provides for the first time molecule scale resolution in fluorescence microscopy. Now, um, throughout the 20th century, the resolution of any fluorescence microscope was fundamentally limited to about 200 nanometers. However, the development of stat microscopy <coughs> at the turn of the century showed that there is physics or physical chemistry in this world that allows you to fundamentally cross the barrier and get a resolution that is better roughly by an order of magnitude as you can see here in this, um, in this image. Now this image is actually taken from the official poster of the 2014 uh, Nobel Prize in Chemistry and said microscopy won a share of this Nobel Prize as it is shown here in the cartoon. Now a couple of years later STAT microscopy was joined uh, by uh, palm storm microscopy which actually uses the same principle of separation which is the on-off principle of separation in order to tell molecules apart that are closer than the fraction barrier. And there is something else in common that palm storm has with that, namely uh, the fact that both methods can in, three, in theory attain a spatial resolution that is of the order of about a uh, molecule size, namely about a nanometer. But at the time the Nobel Prize was given, believe it or not, um, the resolution couldn't get to that level. So the resolution was at most something like 20 nanometers, so roughly by a factor of 10 better. Uh, than a diffraction barrier, but definitely not at 1 to 2 nanometers. So um, the Nobel Foundation put it actually quite nicely in this poster. They said that the Laureus microscope crossed the threshold, but well, it did not attain the ultimate limit. That's why what I am adding right now. And therefore, a major goal in my research lab during the last, say, 5, 6, 7 years was to attain a, a resolution that is truly at the molecular scale, namely down to about the size of a molecule itself, to the molecule itself. Now, in order to explain to you how one could get there, one has to have a thorough understanding of how this super resolution technology works. And as I said, the basic principle of separation is the on-off principle. What does that mean? If you have two, say, fluorescent molecules or fluorescent features, um, you, can, you cannot separate them because they are closer together than the size of the excitation blob of light. But you can tell them apart, you can see that these are separate entities if this one is emitting when this one is not and vice versa, if this one is emitting when this one is not. And this on-off principle of separation allows you to, to recognize that the two, say, floor force or fluorescent features are distinct. This is not a single blob but two separate entities. And this is why uh, you can see here in this cartoon the molecules that are very close. They are 11 nanometers apart and the blob of light of excitation light is much larger and this is why they would fluoresce at the same time and there would be no way of telling them apart unless you introduce this on-off principle, meaning here that if you make sure that only one of the molecules is emitting whereas the other ones are dark, you can tell that molecule apart. You will recognize that this is a separate entity um, um, and, and, and not the same thing as the molecules that are here. And in this case of course you have to have a sort of mechanism that makes sure that the molecules here are not emitting. There must be something that is a mechanism that makes sure that these are not emitting despite the fact that they are flooded with excitation light. This could be a say a molecular transition like cis trans isomerization or photoactivation or anything that sets this molecule apart from the rest. Now, um, once you have identified there, there is this molecule emitting, you uh, have to turn it off and go to the next and you will find there is another one emitting, another one is emitting, another one is emitting, and so you can find out the different um, uh, entities of, uh, of fluorescence emission. But of course, in order to really tell them apart, to make sure that this is not the same that is emitting all the time, you have to find out where the molecules are actually located. So, on offer separation is not enough because you also need a coordinate. Now, the thing is that um, palm storm microscopy, which generally indeed uses individual molecules for separation, which is a great thing, generally palm storm microscopy could not tell molecules apart that are as close as here, say 11 nanometers. Why? Because the localization precision in order to find out where the molecule is actually located was simply not good enough. So the localization precision which is given by the standard deviation in position sigma was usually larger 
than 10 or 11 or 12 nanometers, or like 15 or even 20 nanometers, or even more. And so in this case, you cannot know if it's this molecule that is emitting, or this one is emitting, or this one is emitting. So if you turn this one off and the other one turns on, you may think it's the same molecule, because you cannot tell apart um, their, their position, actually. And therefore, you clearly need something that has higher localization precision in order to resolve uh, fluorescent molecules at this scale. So again, if I'm turning on the next one, it could have been also the neighbor or this neighbor. I'm going to the next. Um, uh, we have the same problem, of course. It's very obvious that we need a higher localization position in order to have a higher spatial resolution. So this brings up the question, why is the localization precision in palm storm so limited? Now the answer is found in the way uh, palm storm localize individual molecules. Now usually you have a wide field illumination, can also be turf, that suppresses the background, but doesn't maximize, so to speak, the localization precision. And then, of course, you have a molecule that needs to be localized, shown in here, as this star. And then this molecule fluoresces, and this fluorescence is imaged onto a camera. Now the camera consists of many pixels, and as a result, produces um, this image of the fluorescent blob. Sometimes it's called point spread function, but that's not the correct way of talking about this diffraction blob of fluorescence light. Now in theory, and also to some extent also in practice, uh, the position of the maximum here um, coincides actually in, um, uh, relates through geometric optics with the position of the molecule here in sample space. So in order to localize the molecule in palm store, what you do um, you kind of calculate the position of the maximum and then you equate that with the position of the molecule in sample space, projected down in sample space, of course. Now, um, the precision of, of, of this localization scales inversely with the number of detected photons. So the more photons uh, make up that, that uh, fluorescent blob of light, the more uh, precisely you will find out the position of its maximum and then you get the localization uh, of the molecule with high precision. As a matter of fact, um, the precision, of course, scales inversely with the square root of the number of detected photons. And so this concept of localization actually maximizes the number of detected photons. And if I, con um, I have a concept that relies on the maximization of the detected photons, then, of course, you also have all the disadvantages that come with maximization of the number of photon detections, which is that the molecule tends to bleach because um, after a while the molecule may cease actually um, from emitting um, fluorescent photons. It, it may uh, bleach entirely, it may go to a dark state. And if you need to wait for large numbers, and of course it also means that, um, that you are slow with localization because you have to wait until you have enough photons to find out where the molecule is. And then there is another problem which is related to the fact that molecules do not emit spheres of light. Basically, they have a dipole emission, meaning that um, if the molecule is oriented like this, the emission goes either this way or that way in the first place. And then this affects actually the actual position of the maximum. So the maximum could be shifted slightly to the left or to the right, depending on how the molecule is oriented in space. And that all contributes to the fact that, um, that the precision of localizing molecules in this way is actually not optimal. Now, having realized that, <coughs> we've come up with a, with a different idea, which is, well, it's clear that you always need a spatial pattern that consists of many photons in order to define a coordinate um, uh, in, in, uh, optically. But if you need many photons, of course, it's not very wise to rely on the photons that are emitted by the molecule, because the molecule emits only a finite number of photons and, and uh, only within a, a short period of time. So it's better, uh, when it comes to localization, it's better to use photons from the laser. And then, of course, you can make uh, the number n of laser photons as large as you want, because there is, there's an infinite number of photons coming from the laser, even under gentle illumination conditions. So, so this insight, of course, um, uh, has allowed us to really come up with this concept, which, um, which is called uh, Minflux. Now I'll explain to you how we define a coordinate using light from the laser. As a matter of fact, it's very simple. So rather than using, uh, say, epifluorescence um, illumination, so wide field or turf illumination, we now um, uh, use a laser beam that is not focused into a spot, but is shaped as a donut. 
like in STAT. But the difference to STAT now is that this is not light for turning molecules off, for de-exciting molecules. It is light for exciting molecules, for, for creating signals, so to speak. And then, of course, you can easily um, appreciate that this donut consisting of, of many photons that are emitted here from the laser very precisely um, defines a position here in sample space. So the donut pattern, of course, has a very well defined position of, um, um, of uh, uh, the position of its center, of its minimum intensity. So here the intensity of the of the um, uh, excitation light is actually minimal, it's uh, ideally zero, and this position is very well defined. And then the only thing we have to do is we have to find out how far the molecule is away actually from the position uh, of the donut zero. If it's far away, like here, then of course um, the molecule will emit very brightly. And those, uh, say, fluorescent photons are detected here by a confocalized detector, so there's no camera in here, it's just a detector with a confocal pinhole. And um, if, um, if the two coincide in space, uh, the zero and the molecule, then this detection here will stop because um, here the molecule is not excited. Keep in mind this is excitation light and if the excitation in intensity here is zero at the donut center, the molecule will not emit. So in a way we can find out how far the molecule is actually away from the donut zero just by looking at the number of uh, photons that are detected here by the detector Within, within a certain period of time. So the brightness will tell us how far the molecule is away from the donut zero. And this is now very interesting because uh, we always know where the donut is located because the donut can be controlled by um, the beam deflector. So here um, this beam deflector can shift the donut around with arbitrary precision, nanometer or angstrom precision even. And then of course the only thing we need to do is we need to find out the distance actually between the molecule and the known position of the donut zero and that can be inferred from the brightness of fluorescence detection. And so um, uh, this concept as I will show in a second um, is perfect to minimize the number of uh, needed detections um, in order to localize the molecule with arbitrary precision, fluorescent molecule with arbitrary precision. Now. Um, uh, in order to explain this to you in a, say, in a very vivid way, I have come up with a little demon and this little demon now can act on the beam deflector. And the demon of course is very clever and because it's clever it always knows, let's assume that in the solid experiment, uh, it always knows where the molecule goes to. And so if the molecule starts moving, the demon of course would just push um, the beam deflector around such that the zero of the donut perfectly coincides with the position of the molecule. And therefore, um, there will be no fluorescence emission because uh, here um, uh, the donut zero um, coinciding with the position of the molecule cannot make the fluorescent molecule emit because there is no um, excitation intensity um, at this point. Yet, uh, the demon can trace um, the position of the molecule with, with arbitrary precision because it must be identical with the position of the donut zero. So this thought experiment tells us something very important. So at least in principle, in this limiting case of a thought experiment, one can come up with a concept that doesn't require any fluorescence emission of the molecule, yet we would know the position of the molecule with arbitrary precision. So this is just the opposite to what we've seen before, where we had to maximize the number of fluorescence detections. Here we would minimize the number of fluorescence detection and we'll get basically an arbitrary precision. Now there's another interesting aspect um, about it. Um, uh, you may remember your school days when you or days at university where you learned that the resolution always scales with the wavelengths. Um, <clears throat> in this limiting case um, there's even no wavelength dependence essentially because what we're doing is we're matching two points. Um, the zero of the of the donut and the molecule which are which are essentially two points and then the wavelength doesn't matter. So this is um, um, just a conceptual um, uh, sort of interesting aspect of this way of localization. Now in practice there's no such thing as a demon but what we can do is of course we can come up with an electronics that kind of mimics a demon. And this is done in here. So we have um, uh, here a controller that actually registers the number of detected photons and the controller acts on the beam deflector. And if the molecule starts um, moving, 
then of course uh, the two will not always coincide in space. The zero will not always coincide with the position of the molecule. There will be some fluorescence emission that will be detected here um, by the detector. But the brightness uh, of detection here will tell us how far the molecule is away from the actual position of the zero. And that is registered here by the controller and the controller acts on the beam deflector. Uh, and the beam deflector shifts of course the zero around such that it, the two ideally perfectly coincide in space, but that will never happen. Yet, the photons that we detect here are just used for, for a refinement of the position of the molecule. They are not required to locate the molecule per se, they are just used for finding out where um, the molecule is located um, um, in relation to the position um, uh, of the donut zero. And for that you need much fewer photons. Now, in order to explain to you what that means uh, in practice and how we find out the position of the molecule, um, uh, I have prepared um, a little cartoon that actually shows <coughs> how we can detect actually the position of a molecule that is located within this distance L. So L should be now a region or um, say a, a linear uh, a scale, a dimension, a one dimension, a single dimension in which the molecule can be located anywhere between the purple and the orange points. It could be here or here or here. Let's assume for the moment it is here. So how would we find out where the molecule is? So the donut zero would be first here and then of course we would move it across this line such um, that here the zero of, um, of the intensity of the, of the donut coincides in space with the molecules. This is the profile of the intensity profile of the, of the donut and this is the fluorescence that we get as a result. Again, if it moves, now the zero here coincides with the position of the molecule, then the fluorescence here is minimal, and this must be the position of the, of the molecule. Now you may think that in order to locate the molecule like this, you have to scan um, the donut across the molecule very densely, as I'm showing you now, but this is not the case, because usually we know the profile of the intensity here, and we would know the profile that we would get, therefore it's perfectly enough to have um, um, the two endpoints. Uh, if you have the two endpoints, you can calculate where XM is. In other words, you can put the donut here, you can put the donut here, you can jump from here to here, and then you would find out uh, where the molecule is located because, because you can find out, so to speak, from, from the brightness of the two endpoints where XM actually is, because in order to do that, the only thing you have to do is you would have to invert an e equation, a quadratic equation, and then you find out the position XM is given by L, divided by unity plus um, square root of n1 over n2, so the two endpoints. Now this little equation tells us a lot because it means that there is no wavelength dependence in it anymore and um, also the molecular orientation doesn't really matter um, and um, because all these polarization things are actually taken care of by, by the excitation donut. Now the precision with which you can find out the position of the molecule now scales again inversely with the square root of the number of, of, of detected photons. So this is the number of totally detected photons and 0 plus 1, 1. But that's nothing new. But the new thing is the fact that the precision sigma now scales with L, with this region L. And why is this so important? This is important because um, if we try to locate the molecule, we don't have to, to get um, um, in the first place um, or in the first step the highest possible sigma. It's perfectly enough to have first a coarse location of the molecule, to go iteratively about the position of the molecule. And once we have determined, well, it's not within this range, but only within that range, then we just make that range in which we look for the molecule, this range L, smaller. And then if you make it smaller, of course, what happens according to this equation, the precision goes up. And then, of course, it means that we can save photons because the precision um, becomes larger, so sigma becomes smaller, due to the fact that we've made L smaller. So in other words, uh, making L smaller is very, very effective because it scales linearly. The, the, the uncertainty scales linearly with L and not with the square root. So it's more effective to reduce L than, than to wait for more photons to come. So in other words, if we just find out the position of the molecule iteratively, we can save many, many photon detections. And that is, that is uh, the actual reason why we can, we can save a number of photon detections. Or, to come back to the demon case, if you bring the zero very close to the molecule, on average, uh, you need fewer 
detect that photons in order to look, find out where the molecule is. Now, in two dimensions, um, it is possible to use three points, so you would use three points to find out where the molecule is. It's better to use four, that's what we did initially. You can also use five or six or seven or so. Uh, three is mandatory, um, and the more you have, um, actually, um, the more precise you can be at, at the expense of maybe jumping around or so. But um, it doesn't really matter because in the end what matters is the region actually in which you look for the molecule, where you have to look for the molecule because you don't know where it is. But again, once you um, uh, decide that you go iteratively about the position of the molecule, so you made the first iteration step where you find out, okay, it's not within this large circular range, but it's within this smaller circular range. You can make L larger and therefore increase, uh, L smaller, I'm sorry, and then, and then increase the precision uh, with which you uh, find the position of the molecule just by going closer to, to the molecule itself. Now, as a rule of thumb, you need 20 to 100 times fewer detections for localization than you would need with a, a normal, uh, say, localization procedure. Okay, that has allowed us, and we call this concept min flux because we operate with a minimum uh, intensity and we minimize the the fluorescent photon flux. So this, this concept min flux has now allowed us for the first time to separate molecules that are as close as say 11 nanometers. As it is shown here, palm storm couldn't do that with this, a given number of photons, but min flux clearly did, as you can see in here. So we can <coughs> get a localization precision that is of the order of about uh, one nanometer and the molecules are separated, again provided that they emit separately um, so that you have an on-off state transition. Now, even molecules that are 6 nanometers close can be separated. Palm storm with a given number of detections not, but mean flux um, can do it. And this is kind of, um, this was kind of surprising at a time. It was published first a couple of years back because um, it was shown through these experiments that although we use regular objective lenses in focused visible light, provided that a fluorophores can be switched individually on and off, we can attain the maximum optical resolution that is achievable namely a resolution at a scale of the fluorophores themselves. Now, why can we do that? Because we need fewer detections of fluorescent photons in order to find out where the molecule is. Um, um, we, um, because of that, we can also be faster, so there is less drift, and we have negligible dependence on the emission dipole orientation that would otherwise shift the, the, the pattern around on the camera in a normal palm stone localization and would compromise, of course, the localization precision. Now, there's something that I would like to mention now, that the molecule scale optical resolution has been reached finally. Um, for those of you who want to apply those microscopes, keep in mind, and now it really matters, that what the microscope actually images is nothing but the flow force. The microscope can never image the pro proteins or, say, just the microtubules or, or just, just the nucleic acids or, or whatever. It images fluorophores, nothing but fluorophores. In other words, um, you have to think about the way you label your sample because the image that you get is just a rendition of the fluorophores. So if, for example, we have something that looks like a mitochondria and you have here the inner membrane and, and we have here the, these little stars that are label, labeling these specific sites, the ideal, perfectly resolved image would just render dots, nothing else. And if the dots are just 5 nanometers apart, the resolution that the microscope has is 5 nanometers because the concept of resolution can only be applied to the fluorophores. It can never be applied to proteins or nucleic acids or lipids or whatever because it doesn't see those entities. The resolution concept can only be applied to fluorophores. And so if you can separate two fluorophores, you have a resolution um, that are 5 nanometers apart, you have a resolution of 5 nanometers because the concept resolution is applied only to flow force. So, if you want to see something that is, um, uh, that is uh, more densely labeled, of course, then you can have a clue of, of maybe of the crystal, for example, as they shown here in this view graph. But in the end, don't, don't forget what you see is just the flow force. Even the perfect image gives you nothing but a flow force. The limits are no longer set by the, optical, um, uh, by the optical imaging, but the limits uh, of what can be inferred biologically are now set by the labeling. So if you have a flow for that is far away from the protein of interest, you have to keep this distance in mind. 
five years back, 10 years back, even 20 years back, of course, this didn't matter. But now that we can, say, resolve and locate fluorescent molecules so precisely, all of a sudden, of course, it really matters how far the fluorophore is away from the protein of interest. Okay, so far I have sh just shown small fields of view. Of course, it's possible to take longer fields of view just by um, locating and um, say turning on and off individual fluorophores, as it is uh, shown here in the view graph and um, shown here in this um, one um, very, say, initial uh, recording where we attain the sp uh, spatial precision of the order of uh, 0.9 nanometers, both an X and Y, so below one nanometer, which was a really a record at that time. Even if you take into account uh, movement, jitter, or drift or something, effective for resolution is below three nanometers. And if we now um, zoom in into these nuclear pores, um, uh, what we actually see is, of course, individual blobs that can be associated with individual flow force, not with the nuclear proteins themselves, of course, because, as I said, what we see is just the flow force. But again, um, uh, you, you can relate now uh, much better to the structure of the underlying nuclear pore because uh, <clears throat> the resolution, of course, with which you see the flow force is, is very, very high. And then, of course, you have to find out how far is the flow force actually away from the actual protein of interest, with, which depends on the type of labeling uh, that you're using. Now, the resolution is better by an order of magnitude than that which is in turn better by an order of magnitude than confocal microscopy. So from confocal to minflux, you have two orders of magnitude of resolution increase. And as I said, um, minflux provides the resolution that is at the scale of the floor for itself. It can, with some limitations, of course, apply it also to, to live cells, as it is shown in here. In this case, you need some, something like a, a switchable floor for or activatable floor for. In this case, it was a uh, um, activatable fluorescent protein called a maple. This also requires that um, the recording is quick. This is why the, the field of view is so small in here because if it's uh, if it's not quick, then the, the you know living cell, of course, there is a substantial movement and that will blur out the position. As a result, also will blur out the image because it always takes time to find out where the molecule is. Now it is very clear that in order to have an impact in biology, one requires readily available and reliable microscopes. And this is why I'm making a disclaimer in here, making you aware that I own share of, of Abair and Abair instruments that manufacture both fluorophores and uh, super-resolution microscopes as, um, as a, say, a matching entity. And um, uh, Abair came up with, um, with the first molecule size resolution uh, microscope, commercially available micro microscope, namely a, a minflux, commercial minflux system. And the data that I'm going, uh, going to show you now are actually taken with um, this um, commercial setup. <clears throat> it's actually three dimensional data, um, and the Z resolution is not bad in here because. Um, uh, it is 1.6 nanometer localization precision. It's even slightly better than X and Y, um, which is only 2.2 nanometers. But what you see here is a, a very nice three-dimensional rendition of the nuclear uh, pore complex and actually of the flow force that are attached to this nuclear pore complex, to be very precise. Now, this requires a different type of donut. It's shown in here. And it requires, of course, measurement points that are not just in the focal plane, but also above and below the focal plane. That is actually shown in here. Another example is the imaging of a protein called PSD95 um, at the postsynaptic site um, in neurons. Now what you see here um, is actually a rather blurred uh, recording recorded with a confocal um, imaging modality due to the poor spatial resolution of about 200 nanometers. The, the spatial arrangement of this protein PSD95 could not be um, disentangled. Now, um, uh, 3D minflux can actually uh, see the, um, the distribution of this protein in this postsynaptic site. Please uh, note the scale bar, one micron in here. And in fact, it's a 3D recording. Um, and the color now encodes for a position in the Z direction. And now the high spatial resolution clearly gives you a, a, <clears throat> a very good quantitative uh, feel for how the protein is actually um, arranged in space. 
Now, another area of application is to look into the nanoscale architecture um, of, uh, of axons uh, in neurons. This, these are just random imaging examples, but this is a, a nice object because it's periodically arranged and also is ring-like shaped in, if, you, if you cut it uh, across um, uh, the axon. And here, the 3D Minflux, of course, provides um, the spatial <coughs> arrangement, actually, of this beta-2 spectrin um, uh, protein. Now, not only you can use a Minflux for imaging, due to the fact that we can uh, localize the molecules, much fewer detected photons at a given precision, um, we can also use Minflux for tracking individual um, uh, fluorescent molecules. And here, say, <coughs> a precision of 30 nanometers was achieved within only 230 to 140 um, microseconds. That's about 100 times faster than with a normal camera. And here you can get more than 12,000 uh, localizations, actually, um, before, uh, before the dye bleaches, uh, for example. And I think um, the application of Minflux to dynamical changes or to movements and to, and to um, small dislocations that happen on a very, very short period of time is actually a very, very important area uh, that you will see developed soon. Now, um, talking in general about applications, of course, um, these applications to neuron are by no means paradigmatic. You can apply it to the nucleus because with Minflux you can actually focus deeper into the cell. It's very important because it's not a turf bound arrangement. It has a confocal pinhole. You can use it basically like a confocal microscope. You can go deeper into deeper layers of the cell. You can image the ER, Golgi, um, vesicles, of course, synapse, and so on. And as I indicated, you can definitely apply it to molecular dynamics, possibly watching protein folding or any kind of interactions, conformational changes, and so on. And another interesting area of application is, um, I think, um, a drug discovery, because you can maybe look into the mechanistic action of, of drugs. And with that, uh, I thank you very much for listening so patiently. And I thank, of course, all the people, um, many of them PhD students and postdocs who have contributed, actually, uh, to the development um, of this very, very exciting direction in fluorescent light microscopy. Thank you very much.